Hello, my name is Dick Baldwin, and I want to welcome you to my online lectures for ITSC 2321, Object-Oriented Programming Using Java. This series of online lectures will approximate the lectures that I normally deliver in the classroom each semester. When completed, this series of online lectures will consist of quite a few hours of video material broken, broken down into 15 different lectures. Each lecture will be broken down into YouTube length segments of approximately 15 minutes each. This is the beginning of part one of lecture four titled Abstract Methods, Abstract Classes, and Overridden Methods. I invite you to visit my college website at the URL that I am highlighting now where you will find the syllabus for this course along with other online information regarding the course. I also invite you to visit my personal website at the URL that I am highlighting now. You will find more than 600 tutorials that I have written on various aspects of computer programming, digital signal processing, and other computer related topics on that site. Those students who are enrolled in this course are expected to study my tutorial lessons numbered 1600 through 1630 at the URL that I'm highlighting now, in addition to the material in the course textbook. So without further delay, let's enter the world of object-oriented programming. Welcome to the beginning of lecture number four titled Abstract Methods, Abstract Classes, and Overridden Methods. In this lecture you will not only learn about abstract methods, abstract classes, and overridden methods in general, you will also learn about overriding the method named toString. You will also learn a little about using random numbers. The program that I will explain in this lesson produces no graphics and does not require the use of Barb Erickson's media library. The program that I will explain in this lesson illustrates the following object-oriented programming concepts. Extending an abstract class, parameterized constructors, defining an, a an abstract method in the superclass and overriding it in a subclass, the overridden toString method. The program specifications are to write a program named prob04 that uses the class definition that you see on the right hand side of your screen to produce the output on the command line screen that you see here. This program generates and uses a pseudo random data value each time it is run. Therefore the actual values that are displayed in the last two lines on the right of your screen will differ from one run to the next. However, in all cases the two values must match. You may define new classes as necessary to cause your program to behave as required. However, you may not modify the class definition 
shown on the right of your screen. As usual, I will break this program down and explain it in fragments. I will begin my explanation with the driver class, which is named Prob04. This driver class is shown in its entirety on the right of your screen. The import directive that is highlighted on the right of your screen is required because the program requires access to the random class and the date class. Both of those classes are defined in the package named java.util. So here is our first question. What is the meaning of the asterisk in the import directive that I just highlighted on the right of your screen. One way to view the meaning of the asterisk is that it indicates a lazy programming practice. Rather than to use the asterisk, it would be better programming practice to provide two explicit import directives, one for the random class and the other for the date class. However, if you are lazy, like I apparently was when I wrote this program, you can use the asterisk wildcard character to import all of the classes in a package with one import directive. Note, however, that the wildcard, wildcard character does not cause the import directive to include classes in packages that are children of the specified package. Now let's turn our attention to the concept of an abstract method. I will begin by skipping down to the highlighted line of code on the right of your screen and explaining the declaration of the abstract method named getData. So here's the next question. What is the purpose of an abstract method? And the answer is, the purpose of an abstract method declaration is to establish the signature of a method that must be overridden in every non-abstract subclass of the class in which the abstract method is declared. As you can see, the highlighted abstract method on the right of your screen has no body. Therefore, it is incomplete. It has no behavior and it cannot be executed. An abstract method must be overridden in a subclass in order to be useful. The same abstract method can be, and often is, overridden in different ways in different subclasses. In other words, the behavior over the, of the overridden version can be tailored to the class in which it is overridden. The existence of an abstract method in a superclass guarantees that every non-abstract subclass of that superclass will define or inherit a concrete executable version of a method having that same signature. 
So here's another question for you. What is the consequence of declaring a class abstract as in the code on the right of your screen? As you can see, the class named Prob04 on the right of your screen is declared abstract. The consequence of declaring a class abstract is that it is not possible to instantiate an object of the class. Any class can be declared abstract, so an interesting question is, when is it necessary to declare a class abstract? A class must be declared abstract if it contains or even if it inherits one or more abstract method declarations. You might wonder why classes are declared abstract. The reason is that it must not be possible to instantiate objects containing incomplete methods that cannot be executed. Another reason is that the author of the class may have a reason to prevent the instantiation of an object from the class even if none of the methods in the class are abstract. As you have learned in previous lectures, the driver class for every Java application must contain a method named main with a signature that matches the method sig signature shown for the main method on the right of your screen. The main method on the right of your screen instantiates a new object of the class named random. I will explain this only briefly. Mainly, I will leave it as an exercise for the student to go to the Java documentation and read up on the classes named random and date and the method named get time. I normally re refer to this as a pseudo random number generator. The reason is because the sequence of numbers that it will produce will probably repeat after an extremely large number of values has been generated. If it were a true random number generator, that sequence of values would never repeat. One source of true random data is the radio frequency noise that is received from space on various radio frequency telescopes. Of course, that's true unless ET is out there trying to send us a message. In that case, the sequence of values that would be received would not be random. 